I just want to thank you all for um, having me here in the Myositis Association. This is actually my first meeting. I'm um, Dr. Namita Goyle. I'm a neurologist at University of California, Irvine. And I started my career in myositis at Mass General Hospital. Um, and that's where I first became exposed to myositis patients and really understood the complexity of taking care of patients with myositis, and also became really passionate about the different treatment choices that are available in myositis, along with um, clinical trial drugs as options for patients when they aren't responding to some of the more conventional treatments. Um, so my main disclosure is, while I look very young, and some people, when I walk into the room, think I'm a medical student, I've actually had 10 years of experience working with and treating myositis patients, and I'm happy to be here today to share some of that experience with you guys today. So um, we're going to spend this session talking about the myositis medications in dermatomyositis and polymyositis. And one of the most important, I did this session on Thursday, and we're repeating it today, and what I really wanted to emphasize um, is that there are many options available. So while um, many times clinicians say, oh, we have steroids, and then we have a few agents, um, beyond that, there are actually third-line or biologic agents or clinical trials used. And so knowing this information for you guys as patients is actually empowering, because if you're not your own advocate, sometimes you have to educate your clinicians or your physicians um, about the options that are out there. And so what I'd like to do is just go over some of the drugs that are available, and then what questions, if you don't, if you don't even know uh, what to ask, you're not going to be able to help um, ask or pick the right drug that may be for you. So some of the most important questions to always ask your physician is the side effect profile of a drug, sort of outweighing the risks and benefits. All of these drugs do come with a panel of risks. Um, oftentimes the benefits outweigh the risks, and then in some instances the risks may outweigh the benefit. So asking about that is very important. Also, um, when I decide a treatment regimen for a patient, I sort of think of it as a team effort. This isn't my decision. Um, I like to pose options and choices for the patient. Sometimes it has to do with the dosing regimen. There are some medications that are dosed daily or twice daily some weekly, some monthly, some that are given orally, some that are injected or infused. And knowing all of this information helps you as a team decide what drug is best used. Um, and then the last point I'll make later on in this session is what to ask for when you're not having a treatment response. Is it because of certain alerts and I'll give you some alert signs to think of and discuss with your physician if there's absolutely no response to some of the medications. So um, another very important point is that when I meet a patient for the first time with myositis, I always tell them it's my utmost priority and responsibility to try to get you better. One of the reasons why I love treating patients with myositis is because most or a majority of patients can get better with immunotherapy. And sometimes, while it may not be the most conventional treatment, there are other options out there where if one treatment you don't respond to, another one you may respond to and have a much better response. Um, and the reason we have even come to all these choices is because our understanding of these treatment options have been based on clinical trials, expert opinions, um, 
retrospective case studies that in review of a case series of a number of dermatomyositis patients, what did they use or who responded better to what treatments? And that's sort of how we as the expert panel have come to help patients with myositis or decide even how to pick what's sort of the first line agent, second line agent, and then other options. And so I never tell every patient that we're going to go through this exact regimen like a cookbook recipe. Um, and if you look at the published guidelines, there's really no definite published guidelines on how to treat myositis because what we know is that every disorder and every subset, um, every patient is sort of treated a little bit differently and can respond in a different manner. There's sort of a general overview. And what I'm going to show you today is sort of the general overview we use, but when to start thinking of these other agents. Um, I will say that almost all experts, the fourth bullet point, agree that the first line therapy is steroids. Um, and most patients should be immediately started on steroids. And then it becomes equipoise or sort of optional when and how to pick the other agents. But I'll give you some of the guidelines that have been published, suggestions made, as well as my experience in treating some patients that have responded quite well to some of these immunotherapy agents. So this is sort of the approach many experts use in treating myositis. And like I said, um, steroids are the first line treatment for dermatomyositis and polymyositis. They're cheap, they're efficacious, and um, they work really fast. So with those three um, bullet points, you really can't go wrong. Generally, the dose that patients are started at is around 0.75 to 1 milligram per kilogram a day, and we try not to exceed 60 to 80 milligrams daily. In someone with very severe weakness, I'm talking about progressive muscle weakness, dysphagia, interstitial lung disease, severe rash, we even will do, at the onset of symptoms, a short course of IV steroids. So you can give them IV steroids for over a two to five day period sometimes, and then you follow it with a high dose of steroids. What's important, once someone is started on high dose steroids, we like to see them maintained on high dose steroids and not tapered until either two points. One, that their muscle strength has improved to the point of resolve and they've gotten back. I like to keep them back to their muscle strength at at least of about a month before I start the taper. Or let's say their slope to improvement has been going like this over potentially a two to three month period and then they're at about 75, 80% better, but then their slope of improvement has plateaued out. That's another safer time where you want to start considering tapering the high-dose steroids. Um, what you don't want to do is start tapering the steroids when the slope of improvement is still on this high slope. So if someone's improving over a month and they've... Um, still on this trajectory of improvement. Every week they're noticing some improvement. You don't want to start the taper and potentially abort that improvement, which then usually leads to a flare or an exacerba exacerbation. Um, but that's sort of why I have this last bullet point that people should be maintained on high-dose steroids for two to four months. Um, as an asterisk because some would argue, oh, you can start tapering over four weeks. And I think the key really is each individual patient has a little bit of a different response to improvement. Some may respond quite quickly, and some will take longer. I would say the majority of patients I've met do take sort of a two- to three-month period before their improvement plateaus out, and I generally don't taper until I see them back in about three months 
Um, you had a question, sir. High dose steroids. What would I choose? So the question is, um, when would I not choose high dose steroids or steroids in general? Even um, for me, any patient that is initially presenting without any history of prior treatment to myositis, they're an absolutely new diagnosis. I will always try to use steroids. I'm cautious in the patients that have um, diabetes or brittle diabetes because of the blood sugar issue. Um, and I generally will still try a relatively higher dose of steroids, like 40 milligrams, but I'll ask them to be in very close contact with their primary care physician. The times that I may choose not to use steroids um, is if I've met a patient that has already been through the rigmarole and they're coming to me for their second or third opinion on is this myositis or not. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that in the next few slides of why I choose that maybe steroids aren't going to be effective in that. Uh huh. And so he immediately skipped to the next levels. I see. Um, I don't do that. I, e even if someone has severe osteoporosis, there is benefit of placing them um, on steroids. And even a low dose steroids, like 20 milligrams, can be quite efficacious, oftentimes in conjunction with another therapy. But um, there are mechanisms to treat osteoporosis with Forteo or Fosamax. And I generally counsel my patients that you should be on these supplements. And we will do a bone density scan to monitor to see if there's severe worsening. Um, but generally, I will still use a low-dose prednisone in that case. Um, and then the time to taper, like I was saying, was generally when patients improve with their muscle strength, I feel that that's a safer time to taper. Um, at the same time, we know steroids come with the profile of side effects, and we can't leave someone on high dose, and by high dose, I usually mean over 20 milligrams of prednisone for an extended period of time without dealing with the ugly profile of side effects. Um, so we try to get patients down to at least 20 milligrams, but I like to do it slowly. And so the recommendations are is that you can decrease steroids by about 10 milligrams when they're on do doses higher than 20 milligrams. Every, some people say every four weeks. I'm a little more conservative, and I like to say every two months. Um, other neurologists that I've trained with and worked with over the years would say two months as well. It is a little bit patient per patient dependent. Um, I, I generally start with sort of a two month interval of taper. If a patient tells me that um, we dropped the steroids and immediately I noticed worsening of weakness, I will counsel them to go back to their dose that they were on previously and not wait too long, because the longer you can wait, the harder and more resistant to um, prednisone you may become. And then once we get to doses of 20 milligrams, the taper slows down a little bit. So then the taper, the recommended taper is by 5 milligrams, again, every four to eight weeks is sort of the interval that we like to use. When you hit 10 milligrams, the taper gets even slower, and it's recommended to go down by about 1 to 2.5 milligrams. Some say every four weeks, some even extended out to six months. 
And that should really, again, be devised on a patient-per-patient -patient basis. Anytime I tell my patients to taper, before they even leave clinic, I give them advice that if you notice that when you drop the dose of prednisone, you've had some worsening of weakness or worsening of function. Previously, you were able to raise your arms without difficulty, and then you drop the dose of prednisone, and a week later, you were noticing that it's becoming harder. That's the time that you shouldn't wait. You need to call me, and we need to go back to the dose you were previously on. Usually, the longer you wait, the more of a flare or an exacerbation that happens. Um, and the goal is really to be able to reduce the dose to the lowest effective dose, but maintain disease control, All, along with balancing the side effects. Um, and if you do this rapid taper, then um, what ends up happening is that there is a back and forth of the disease worsening, you're increasing the steroids, and it just becomes a teeter-totter, vicious effect that you try to avoid. There's a question. Yes, um, my name is Kathy, this is my sister Joanne, and she has Kathy. polymyositis. And she's been on prednisone for three years, but she's doing some tapering now. And my question is, um, her doctor has her doing 13 milligrams every, every other day. Okay. And to me, that doesn't make sense because I feel like she's going up and down. And does that, does that something you do, an every other day thing? So every other day uh, dosing regimen is actually quite appropriate and... Um, many clinicians do use that. I do use that for some patients. Every other day doesn't necessarily mean um, there's an up and down dose. Prednisone lasts in the system long enough to be able to do an every other day dose. That's a very good question. Um, uh, what it does allow is that you can get to a lower dose in sort of a faster way with less side effects sometimes. Thank so um, it's actually a reasonable approach as long as she's not having flares. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, what I do want to mention, as some of us have already alluded to here, is that prednisone's a great drug. It's cheap, it's effective, and it works fast. However, it's an ugly drug. It comes with a panel of side effects, and there's no pun intended. Um, I actually tell all my patients that they should really closely follow with their primary care physician, because it's important to know that prednisone affects your blood pressure, it affects your blood sugar levels, even if you don't have diabetes. I, I've seen and heard of many patients saying they develop diabetes while they're on steroids. Um, it's important to monitor your electrolytes. Sometimes it can alter your potassium levels. And it's also very important to get a routine eye exam once a year. Um, cataracts, glaucoma can develop while you're on steroids. And all my patients, I always get a baseline bone density um, scan as well as an annual bone density scan because we know osteoporosis is a risk of steroids. In fact, all of my patients, regardless of their age, if they're 30 or if they're 50, I put on vitamin D and calcium. And then if they're at higher risk of osteoporosis based on your bone density scan, it's an important conversation to have with your primary care physician about getting treated with something like Fosamax or Forte or something stronger. And, but that's a conversation that should be had with the primary care doctor. Um, but it's certainly not a contraindication to starting steroids. Um, so I generally, even if someone does have osteoporosis and I'm trying to get them better, I will put them on steroids, but I'll be very cautious and I'll monitor with their bone density scan to answer your question. Um, weight gain, as you know, is a side effect of prednisone. We all hate it. We all try to avoid it. I tell my patients, when you're tired at night, 
Um, it gives you the munchies and the cravings. And I want to go for the potato chips at midnight when I'm tired. Um, but when you're on steroids, I think it's really important to make some healthy diet choices with low sodium, high carb, high protein, low carb, high protein diet. Um, and if, if it's not working, because um, many of you do try to avoid some of the foods rich in calories, it's important to ask your neurologist or rheumatologist to refer you to a dietitian or a nutritionist that can do a better job of sort of helping you with calorie count and making um, diet choices for you that will help monitor the weight gain. There's a question. Yes. I have two questions. The, the blood sugar, my primary care said, well, you're on steroids, so I'm not going to give you that test because it's going to be, you know, the numbers won't reflect what the true thing is. But it, it seems like it probably would have been a good idea to have that done. I'm sorry. So your primary care son said, because you're on prednisone, I'm not going to monitor your blood sugar level because it's going to be off anyways. Oh. <laughs> no? Not I, a good thing? I, I, I do, I'm speechless um, right now. because The question is, um, while you're on steroids, um, should your blood sugars be monitored? And absolutely. Um, there are some patients where the blood sugars don't necessarily go out of whack. Some patients where the blood sugars go out of whack and need to be monitored on a closely uh, regimen then on sometimes even a monthly, daily basis. Um, there's some patients that develop diabetes while they're on steroids because their blood sugars were so out of control. Oh. Um, so it should be monitored. Would that be similar with testing the cholesterol? Um, cholesterol is a completely different. It's completely, because that's um, another agent. thing that she didn't test because I was on that. Yeah. No, routine, um, all my patients know that their neurologist and rheumatologist is not going to do, that. they're there to help treat the myositis um, and counsel you about the side effects, but they're not going to do as good of a job as a primary care doctor does in um, treating those blood sugar elevations, the blood pressure. And if, um, if you don't get that from your current primary care, then it may be good to get an opinion from another primary care doctor. OK, thank you. I have one more question. Yes. I had a thyroidectomy done in 2011, so I have a thyroid doctor. And he watches, he monitors my bones. And he put me on Fosmax again because of the prednisone. And he said, even though I dropped the prednisone down, you know, below the 20 in a relatively short amount of time, he said I had to stay on it, the Fosamax, for three years because that's what the studies showed. There were no studies to say if you come off Fosamax. Plus, he was concerned that if I had to go back on the prednisone, once you come off, you can't just jump right back on. And he only ordered, ordered a bone scan for me in the beginning as just to take a check and then three and then two and a half years later, not I, annual. I see. Um, an endocrinologist is actually very well informed about osteoporosis treatment and management. And um, if that's his guidelines, I would go with that because um, not every patient with myositis on steroids has to be followed by an endocrinologist. I think a very good primary care doctor does a great job managing that. But if you have thyroid issues and other endocrine issues, um, to have those recommendations by an endocrinologist and being on Fosamax, protecting your bones, is a, a very good idea. I wonder if he recommended that because your baseline uh, bone density scan already showed osteoporosis, yeah, osteopenia. So you're at high risk for developing osteoporosis. So, um, and then being on immunotherapy um, puts you at greater risk. So, um, prednisone primarily. Yeah, you're welcome. Was there another? Yeah. It's possible. Um, I do like to have my patients have their electrolytes checked, their um, electrolyte levels, including potassium, because it is a possibility that potassium can. Cramps are very nonspecific, but if they're new to you, 
Um, I do, I always start with checking electrolytes, calcium levels, just to make sure. Yeah. Was there another question? Yeah, uh, I'm coming here to support my sister, but uh, we split in between different, because she wanted to attend another one. But they had started her off at like a, a thousand milligrams of the, uh, prednisone, and then they slowly tapered her off. But now the, uh, the uh, polymyositis is coming back, and they want to like increase it. But she doesn't want to go back on um, the prednisone because she has a, a, a Cushing and Kajimoto, and she has the lung, the, the inst interstitial lung disease. Uh -huh. And so um, I was wondering for medications, is there an um, alternative that doesn't have the same, uh, uh, like all the heavy side effect of the prednisone for someone with the uh, polymyositis? Absolutely. So um, the question is, once you've been on high-dose steroids, been through this ugly side effect profile that happens, um, what are the other options? And it's like I planted you there because um, you're the best segue to my next slide. We're going to talk about other options um, because of the side effect profile. So if you just wait one slide, I think I'll get right back to you. Um, but one of the reasons we can sort of say, well, what are our other options is because we ask ourselves, um, are we doing a good job with disease control? And how do the doctors actually monitor disease control? How do we say that things are working or it's not working? And one of the um, best indicators for us as neurologists when we're taking care of myositis patients for treatment response is actually an objective change in muscle strength. So every time I have my patient come in to see me, which is generally every two to three months in clinic, um, we will examine them and score their muscles. We, we examine about five muscles in the arm, five muscles in the leg, and we score those muscles on a scale that's a standardized scale that most neurologists use, um, most neurologists and rheumatologists, and we can determine if there's if the muscle strength is the same, if it's better, or if it's worsened. Um, and based on that, we will then decide on either a dose adjustment of the prednisone or start thinking about alternative agents. Um, as you guys know, muscle enzymes, or CK levels, are important in myositis. Many of you guys probably know your CK or muscle enzyme level. It's not necessarily the best indicator for worsening disease. Um, if you see a little bit of a rise in your CK level, that can sometimes happen on a daily basis or based on activity level. One day my CK level might be 100. Tomorrow it might be 150 if I've gone out for a run or a jog. Um, same thing in myositis. Uh, elevation from 500 to 550 might not necessarily indicate worsening disease. But if the muscle enzyme levels, as your doctors check it, trend in a rise and correlate with muscle weakness, then that's certainly an indicator for worsening or relapse of disease. And then I just briefly want to mention that a newer technique that we're using at some of the academic centers um, to look at disease activity is looking at muscle MRI. So um, you can get an MRI of a muscle and see if there's inflammation or edema. And the idea is that when you give them steroids or there's been a good response, that edema and inflammation goes away. Yet if there is a flare or a re reactivation of the disease, you may see an increase in edema or, mus or inflammation. And that's something you, you may have heard in the meeting. It was mentioned even earlier today in uh, the panel discussion. But there's a question. Yeah, uh, you was talking so much about steroids. I wanted to get into that, but I'm sure, or I'm glad that you got this slide in here too. Uh, when I was first diagnosed, I went on a high dosage of steroids for, well, prednisone for 30 days, and then I was put on IVIG. 
once a month. I had a tremendous boost right off the get-go, but after about six months, I started going downhill, so then they started the IVIG every uh, two weeks. After that, I was still going downhill, and I went through a host of, you know, uh, Imura and Celsep and a couple others with one 10-day uh, storage to try to halt what was going on. And then uh, I went on the methotrexate with my IVIG for three years. But I was still going downhill, but slow. Uh -huh. My CK levels were up. The lowest I got them was 1,200 on those, that uh, dosage of both. Uh, winter before last, I went on a winter vacation and I started going downhill real quick because right before I left, the doctor says, well, since you're still going downhill, we're going to try you on the Imurin with the IVIG and take me off of methotrexate. I started falling. I couldn't go up steps. I couldn't get out of a chair. So she put me on Rituxan with methotrexate, got my CK levels down to 300, lowest I've been. Now I'm starting to climb back up and I'm starting to lose again. Steroids, would that be something to go with what I'm taking now or should I just stay away from it? I mean, I've got other, I'm diabetic, thyroid, high blood pressure, uh, I take blood thinners, the whole shot, you know, mm. so where everybody has problem with steroids with their sugar level going up, I crash. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I go down bad. While I was in the hospital, they had to boost me up. <laughs> yeah. And I was just wondering if that would be something to talk to my rheumatologist about is maybe having a low dosage of steroids with that, that's my real question. Okay, that's a very good question. You actually bring up a very good point. Um, and actually, um, what I was going to talk about next, which is um, oftentimes some patients require, there's two, there's two things that you are bringing up that sort of alert me. Um, from what I'm hearing, this gentleman who's kindly shared his story has been through multiple treatment regimens, sometimes overall with not a robust response, but every now and then has noticed some response, is that correct, to some of the therapies. Um, oftentimes, many patients do require a low dose of steroids along with some of these other agents. Um, and in fact, there was a study done that showed up to 50% of patients um, either require ma being maintained on a low dose of steroids um, or adding on a second or a third agent. And so it's, it's something very reasonable to talk to your doctor about if you would benefit. And by low dose, we usually mean 10 to 20 milligrams of steroids. The reason... Um, it's important to start talking about low-dose versus high-dose steroids. Um, I'm actually gr glad you brought this up as well, is because I've noticed that when you get on doses of 20 milligrams or less, that side effect profile or the nasty side effects that come with prednisone generally start getting less and less. It gets even less when you're on doses of 10 milligrams. But we do know that doses between between um, 10 to 20 milligrams can be quite efficacious, and then just gently tapering from there can be quite efficacious as well. Um, the other very important point you're bringing up is that most patients do respond to some form of steroids along with another combination of therapy. And so if you haven't had 
a robust response to high-dose steroids. And by robust, I mean some patients say, I always ask them, um, if they come to me for a third or fourth opinion for not optimal management on their myositis, um, I ask them, well, when you were placed on high-dose steroids, what was your response of improvement? Did you respond by 10%, 20%, or were you responding at like 50% or greater? If someone can answer that and say, oh, I, my strength got better by at least 50%, it's not 100, it's certainly not even, you know, 80 or 90 percent, I'm still 50 to 60 percent only better, and I want to know what other treatment options are. I start thinking, okay, they had some response, and we just need to do better about managing their myositis. However, if I hear that the response was 10 percent better, I'm not sure that was truly a response or improvement in muscle strength and they were on prednisone for a few months. So that's when I start thinking about other mimickers of myositis, and I ask myself, wait a second, is the diagnosis even correct here? And I think that's very important because a number of patients with inclusion body myositis, there's reports of about 30 to 40 percent of inclusion body myositis patients were initially diagnosed as polymyositis and put through a whole course of treatment regimen, sometimes requiring hospitalizations because of side effects, and there was not really a great response, yet they have to deal with side effects, and the whole time the diagnosis was not correct. There's also a, a number of patients I've sometimes met that didn't have dermato or polymyositis at all, but we're told based on a muscle biopsy with some inflammation that maybe it's polymyositis, um, when actually it's a genetic muscle condition, and that we know that genetic muscle conditions don't respond to steroids or other forms of immunotherapy. Um, so that's really when it's time to sort of reopen the diagnostic um, book again. And it's very important to have a correct diagnosis because if you don't have a correct diagnosis, if you don't know what you're tr we're treating, um, you don't want to go through that panel of all these medications that are potentially potent. Um, the last point I want to make is that um, in some of these myositis, there's an increased risk of malignancy. So every patient that I diagnose with myositis um, and they're in the first two to three years of presentation, the first time they develop symptoms, they should have routine cancer screening, which usually is a chest, CT, abdomen, and pelvis to look for any cancer, um, for a, a colonoscopy, and for females, a ma mammogram. That we is recommended to be um, done at the time of diagnosis, and if it's negative, every six months up to at least two years. If after two years there's no cancer that's found um, from the time of symptom onset, not the time of diagnosis, but the time you initially develop symptoms, um, then the risk of malignancy becomes much less after two years that you've presented. So it's important to ask your doctors have we screened for cancer if you've initially presented with these symptoms? Um, so I want to get to your question um, up in the front here where you were asking about, well, when is it right to start another medication? I think that's a very important time to ask yourself, um, if I've had persistent weakness and the steroids have either helped or not help much at all, would I benefit from an alternative agent or adding a second agent to the steroids? Um, if the steroids helped, but every time we lower the prednisone, another flare develops, that is another time to add a second agent. Um, and in my opinion, when I meet patients that present with what we call moderate to severe disease, and there's not really a great definition of moderate disease, but in my eyes, someone with 
muscle weakness or a severe rash or lung disease that's limiting their daily functional activities is considered moderate to severe. And I right off the bat, um, when I first meet them and they're first presenting, put them on uh, high dose steroids, a second agent, um, and then what it does is uh, it gives us time to then allow for taper of the prednisone because the idea is that the second agent will hopefully take over sort of the benefits of a steroid without the ugly side effect profile that steroids has. So um, what are the agents that we commonly use? Well, it's recommended that in dermatomyositis and polymyositis, and these are sort of relatively newer evidence that um, I'll talk about, is that people are generally recommending starting with methotrexate these days as the second agent. Um, it's an easy medication to take. You can take it as a pill or a subcutaneous injection. I usually dose my patients orally. Um, there has been several reports on the efficacy and of methotrexate. And it's important to get a supplement of folate, folate one milligram daily while you're on methotrexate because methotrexate does deplete your flow of folate levels. And so if your doctor didn't tell you that, you should be on one milligram of folate daily. Um, doctors should monitor your blood counts, your liver and your kidney um, functions. That should be monitored a month after you've started the medication. And then every three months, and then it can be, if you're on a stable dose, it can even be monitored every three to six months. Um, but it is important to monitor these blood counts. Um, methotrexate does have a risk of pulmonary fibrosis. So if you already have interstitial lung disease or the Joe one antibody that some myositis patients have, you should not be using methotrexate. Um, They have not taken you off, and you have pulmonary or interstitial lung disease. So the recommendation is that um, because it can cause pulmonary fibrosis, is we usually stop the medication, and the other agent we use is azathioprine. That one is safe in interstitial lung disease. Um, And I'm going to be giving these slides to the Myositis Association so that they can put up on their site, too. Yeah, um, I absolutely appreciate your professional opinion, but several other doctors have said that it's okay to continue the, the MTX or methotrexate in the face of ILD in the last few days. Yeah. And that met, many of them have seen only five cases of methotrexate-induced ILD in their life and yada, yada. So as long as you're monitoring As long as you're monitoring it, yeah, that's, that's true, absolutely. I know there'd be some confusion. Yeah, no, that's true, absolutely. If, if you have a pulmonologist who's doing a good job monitoring your um, lung involvement, then it's absolutely safe. I was trying to give more of an overview, but absolutely. That really is on the discretion of the severity of um, interstitial lung disease. Some patients, a yearly monitor is fine, sometimes six months. Some patients require even closer than that, and we'll see their, their pulmonologist on a three-month basis. It is a very rare side effect, um, and as long as it's closely monitored and you're not having worsening of it, um, it's fine to remain on it. Um, so azathioprine, if you, at the onset you are known to have Joe one antibody, we do recommend starting with azathioprine then. Um, it, it has similar efficacy to methotrexate. Um, what I like about methotrexate is that we've seen it work faster. Um, generally methotrexate can work up to two to three months, um, while azathioprine may take up to six months to work. Um, yes? Yeah, I'm on methotrexate right now. No sensitase. Someone recommended that I change to the AZ. 
Azathioprine. Um, so you said you're on methotrexate and you haven't had uh, improvement. Is that what you're no, saying? No, methotrexate works. Oh, okay. It's just I lost my sense of taste. Oh, no sense of taste. Someone recommended uh, this. Do you recommend it or do you know anything about it? Well, you know, it's, um, it's, that's a tough choice. Um, if methotrexate is causing you know, a robust response for you. You've had great disease control. Sense of taste is certainly important. It's a pleasure in life at the same time. And um, some agents can do a great job controlling disease, and you may not have optimal um, response with another agent. Azathioprine has been shown to be equally efficacious. It's something that you would have to closely decide with your physician on sort of the risk and benefit of switching to another agent. Um, but the side effect profile is um, similar where you have to monitor blood counts, liver and kidney. Um, it can cause bone marrow suppression, but um, generally it's a well-tolerated drug. There is a small percentage of patients that at the time that they start taking the drug will develop severe abdominal pain vomiting, pancreatitis, in that case, um, absolutely stop the drug. Don't even wait for a call back from your doctor. Um, I tell all my patients, um, whenever I give methotrexate, azathioprine, um, sometimes reading the package insert can drive us all nuts because every single side effect profile is listed on the package insert and doesn't help us necessarily as a community of what to watch for and what not to watch for. But if there's significant abdominal pain, something out of the ordinary, if you're looking for the symptom, maybe it's not there. But if it's apparent, it's a side effect and you're having it, and that needs to be discussed with your doctor. In azathioprine, 10% of patients can actually develop a severe reaction that causes abdominal pain or even pancreatitis, and then the drug should be stopped. Uh, you had a question? On the folic acid, uh, is there a specific one? I mean, if you go into a store, there are like 40 different folic acids that you can pick from. Yeah, that's Some true. Some have calcium and magnesium with them. Uh -huh. That's the more standard. Is there one specific that you recommend? Um, you know, if, if someone's on prednisone, I like the vitamin D with calcium. So if you're getting the calcium through that, um, I like folate standing alone is fine. Um, but, but the dose is what's really important. It's recommended that they should be on at least one milligram. You have to look at the dosage, because a lot of the bottles might say 400 MCGs. Um, you want to get that total dose to a milligram. But it doesn't, to me, it doesn't necessarily matter if it comes with calcium or magnesium or not. Um, I think there are electrolytes that are fine to supplement. Thank you. So azathioprine is another very reasonable agent. Um, methotrexate is dosed weekly. Azathioprine is dosed twice daily. So I tell all my patients with myositis, it doesn't matter if you're 25 or if you're 75, get a pill box. It'll make life easier for you. Um, and especially with a pill like methotrexate where you're taking it once a week, um, just make your pill box for the month and pick a day if it's Fridays as your methotrexate day. Um, but make sure that you're not daily dosing it or um, changing the regimen. You, you have to be very clear on how to take these pills. Azathioprine is typically dosed twice a day. And so making your pill box to have the right dose is important for that as well. Um, and then we're going to get into, so those are some of the more common second-line agents we usually, as myositis experts, start with, either methotrexate or azathioprine. But there's many other options that I just wanted to mention for you guys. Uh, many of you guys that I've even spoken to on the meeting, um, at the meeting, are on mycophenolate, mofetel, or the other name for it is Celsept. Um, it's actually a very reasonable immunosuppressive agent. 
Um, it's one of the older agents out there. It's widely used in transplant medicine. We know it works for immunosuppression. Um, they have studied it in small series of myositis patients, and they've um, seen that it helps with interstitial lung disease and refractory cases of dermato when it's combined with steroids or IVIG, so certainly a reasonable option. And then I've had some patients ask me, oh, I've been on Celsept or mycophenolate and prednisone, and I've been doing well, um, but should I switch to methotrexate or azathioprine? Um, because you mentioned it as more of a more commonly used agent, and I said, absolutely not. If it's working for you, that's what you stick with. Um, but what's more important is to know that if it's not working for you, what are the other treatment options out there? Um, this is also a medication that's dosed twice daily, and it should be dosed at a lower dose if you have kidney problems. IVIG is um, listed as another agent, although it's becoming one of my more favorite um, agents to use. Several studies have shown that it's been quite helpful in myositis. The times that clinicians use it, because it's a costly medication and it's an IV infusion, um, physicians tend to use it if there is refractory disease or if there's flare-ups. Um, if patients have been on prednisone and a second agent, then uh, they will use IVIG to see if it could reboost or sort of reset um, the diagnosis, uh, the muscle disease. The other time that I love using it is if I meet a patient for the first time presenting with weakness and they have moderate to severe disease, I like to even start with IVIG as a one-time dose. Um, um, loading dose given over a two to five day period, and then place someone on high dose steroids, and then a second agent, and see, and then only do monthly dosing if they're having flare ups or it's a hard time to get them off the prednisone. This is an agent that's well tolerated. The side effects are minimal, sometimes flu-like symptoms, headaches during the infusion. We usually like to pre-medicate our patients by giving them Benadryl, um, Tylenol before getting IVIG. That helps some of the side effects. And then rituximab is considered um, an agent used more in patients with refractory or severe disease, patients that have tried some of the more common agents. And the reason being is that there's more risk with rituximab. It depletes your um, CD20 B lymphocytes, and there's a possibility of an acute infusion reaction. There's a possibility of long-term immunosuppression, which is why we sort of move it to a third-line agent, because when we start talking about that risk and benefit scale, and the risks start potentially outweighing the benefits, um, that's when we start moving medications down the line rather than first-line agents. But it can be quite a helpful drug um, if you're having a severe flare or um, have severe persistent weakness. And, yeah, yes. Um, so it just means that if you have baseline, um, if your baseline kidney tests show that there's an elevation in your kidney function and it's not normal, then you typically have to be dosed at a lower dose. Your physician should know that, but it's always empowering if you know that too. And you can say, oh, shouldn't I be on a lower dose if my kidney function is not normal? Oh. Um, no, I, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of times when someone's on an agent, um, clinicians try to use another agent if it's not working, but, um, I'm not worried about restarting Celsept if it worked for them and they were just taken off. Um, 
The long term of two years isn't necessarily a definitive. I think it just suggests that if you're requiring long-term immunosuppression, you're at more risk of long-term side effects. But it's not like there is an absolute cutoff um, that you have to stop it after two years. Okay. I see. So monitoring for your blood counts levels, making sure you're not too immunosuppressed. Sometimes the dose has to be adjusted. Um, and your physician knows to monitor your white blood cell count, your absolute lymphocyte count. Those are all, if they're too low, that can already sort of predispose you to developing infections. Um, generally, if the dose is adjusted, if I notice that their blood counts are too low, I will first try to cut back on the dose and lower the dose and see if it corrects. And I'll repeat a blood count within a few months to see if that worked. You're welcome. Yeah, there's a question back there. Yes. Um, she's been on, uh, she's been, was diagnosed three years ago, um, started on prednisone, then methotrexate, then Athgar, you know, the IVIGs, um, and then um, the rituximab. Nothing has worked. She was told that she, you know, would probably go into remission, but it was probably going to take about a year. She was devastated when she found out a year. It's been three years, and nothing has worked at all. My question is, if she were your patient, what would you do next? And can she never go into remission? I mean, is that possible? I mean... Um, so that's a very good question and a very important question as we talk about medications. Um, and my question back to the, a patient that presents like that is, did you ever have on high dose steroids? Did you ever have any response? Were you better by 10% or were you better by 50% or more? Um, from the steroids, probably about 50% better, but um, it seems the past like six months is getting worse and worse and worse, and I'm having a lot of pain, and, and I was told that in polymyositis you don't really have pain, but um, my arms, my legs, my hips, are just excruciating pain at times, and, and I'm going to Mayo Clinic in Arizona, and um, I'm having a hard time seeing my neurologist. So I'm kind of on my own and don't know what to do. I see. So. Yeah, that's challenging. Um, it's good to hear that you responded to prednisone by at least 50%. If you told me that there was absolutely no response, um, then I would be concerned about your diagnosis. And I would re-examine you. Um, I would request your muscle biopsy slides, um, look at them myself to see if the diagnosis was actually correct, if we needed to. In some cases, I repeat an EMG, um, or I even do a muscle MRI to see if there is uh, disease activity, inflammation, edema in the muscles. There are a subset of patients while um, true, many patients or many doctors even talk about myositis as, oh, the main symptom is muscle weakness, not necessarily muscle pain, but we do see a subset of patients with muscle pain. So I certainly don't discount your pain, um, and I think pain can be a part of it. Um, but I think it's very important that if you did respond to steroids, it's important to have a discussion with your doctor if you need to be on another regimen that involves either low-dose steroids or a, somewhat of a moderate dose until you get better, along with some combination therapy. So sometimes one agent with prednisone may not work, but two agents and prednisone may work. Um, I have some patients that are on 
that were on two agents and came to me for another opinion. And then I put them, that's when I consider putting them on something like IVIG monthly, in addition to azathioprine or Celsept or methotrexate, along with a low dose of prednisone, maybe 20 milligrams. Sometimes it takes that combination therapy to get an optimal response. And then if you can't have a discussion with your doctor or you feel like you have sort of hit a roadblock, um, I even tell all my patients, you know, when they sort of become scared about the diagnosis, I say it's always a good idea to get a second opinion. Um, you sort of get reassured sometimes when you hear two physicians saying the same story, or you are you know, surprised sometimes when you have another physician who just gives you a, a whole different set of recommendations. There is a more senior colleague in my clinic, and he oftentimes will pull me into a clinic room and say, I know this isn't your patient, but I really want you to take a look at this. And sometimes it just takes another set of pair of eyes to, or another you know, mindset to say, hey, let's try this or let's do this. Um, and I think that's very important. If you walk away from the session with nothing gained, I, I would love for you guys to at least know that it's not just one treatment or two treatments and a certain cookbook recipe way of doing it. Um, there's certainly a variety of options and treatment regimens that are out there. And um, there's not really one optimal way of doing things. So um, it does sort of take this joint effort between uh, the physician and the patient to get to your optimal regimen sometimes. And then flares happen. Sometimes you can be doing beautifully on a certain course, and then all of a sudden something just happened and the weakness got worse. Um, yeah, yeah, doctor, quick question. My wife's about to go on IVIG. It, there's like nine or ten companies. Is IVIG the same with each company? Uh, that's a very good question. I, I say t overall, for the most part, um, every company will tell you about the different sort of molecule or sugar level or something that they're using. I haven't seen a robust difference between the different IVIGs. I think if your wife has had, the times that I entertain potentially a different um, IVIG dr company is if they tell me consistently they had a rash or a reaction to, they were on IVIG, they switched companies, they had some reaction, then I'll try to switch them back to that company. But for the most part, I don't, get too worried about the exact company. If your insurance is approving it and it's working, great. But that's a very good question. That comes up a lot. Yes, sir. Question. Um, this is my wife sitting next to me. She's the patient. Um, uh, she's the one that's never been given the pregnant zone. Okay? She presently is being given the Plaquenil and Celsep. Okay. Can you, from those two, can you tell what he is trying to accomplish from those two? And um, is it okay if I ask your diagnosis? The DM. Yeah, you have dermatomyositis. So, um, Plaquenil and Celsep are reasonable medications to use. Plaquenil is more of a connective tissue rheumatologic drug that many rheumatologists will use. Um, Celsept is a very reasonable immunosuppressive agent. It's one of the oldest medications out there, widely used in transplant medicine. We know it works. Um, if you have great disease control or if you've had optimal control, I think that's a fine regimen to use. Um, if you've had suboptimal control, it's reasonable to ask your doctor, would I benefit from even 10 to 20 milligrams of prednisone? I, I know that um, it sounds like they're afraid of using steroids, but sometimes the low-dose steroids don't have as significant side effects, but um, actually two agents, Celsept in conjunction with prednisone, we do know works better. And you may get better control if you need to add a little bit of prednisone. 
would that stop the scalpage? That's the main problem right now, scalpage. Um, and then there's topical agents out there, especially for dermatomyositis. So um, I don't know if you've ever tried any of like the topical steroids. Um, sometimes that can be very helpful for the scalp itching. Um, there are topical agents that can be used um, and should be asked about then. You're welcome. So um, I guess uh, I love all these questions, and I'm glad we're having this. Um, I just wanted to flash up um, some of these other third-line agents, just so you're familiar with the name. Again, um, I'm going to give my slides to the Myositis Association so you guys don't have to take notes um, or memorize. There's not a test at the end. Um, but I just wanted you, you know, I think knowledge is empowering. Um, cycl cyclosporin, tacrolimus, cyclophosphamide have at, all been used um, and looked at in myositis. There's less evidence, but they are immunosuppressive agents. And when we're sort of talking about um, the, what agents to use, the reason we put them sort of at the third tier is because there's less evidence um, and there's more potent side effects. So um, cyclosporin comes with potential risk of kidney damage. Um, cyclophosphamide, there's a risk of bladder issues um, with that. So it's just important to know that if we need to go there, there are some options, but they do have risks. Um, and then there's a number of, that's my pointer. Um, there's another um, number of other sort of investigational agents that have been looked at. Um, a lot of beautiful work that's still being done in myositis. Um, a lot of clinical trials that we even at our site in California participate in. Etanercept and infliximab have been looked at. Um, the outcomes were mixed, so they generally don't make strong recommendations about using them. ACTH gel, Akthar gel, um, has been looked at and is being looked at. It's currently undergoing a clinical trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy in refractory um, myositis patients. Five patients were given Akthar and showed improvement in 12 weeks. So I think there's some interesting data out there, and it has less glucocorticoid side effects potentially than prednisone. Um, and then when we start getting into some very fancy names that um, the key is if you look at the last three letters, the MAB, they're all sort of monoclonal antibodies or these biologic agents that are being looked at and derived. Um, this one's interesting because it affects interleukin-6, which is thought to play a role in inflammation and is trying to stop that from happening. So there's been a few cases of it showing that it was helpful. So that's actually undergoing a trial right now. Um, my pointer is dying, I think. Huh. Can we go to the next slide? Okay. Um, there's another agent, a beta sep, that is targeting CD80 and 86 cells and basically inhibiting T cell stimulation. There's case reports that there's been some help. There's an ongoing trial of this going. Um, another MAB monoclonal antibody that affects B cell and T cell properties. There was a case um, where it showed that it significantly improved strength in a patient with JO1 antibody, but not necessarily respiratory function. Um, another monoclonal antibody that affects interferon signature, and interferon signatures have thought to be affecting uh, myositis patients with increased levels. So if you can suppress that, um, which they've done a phase one trial in, they've shown that with this agent you can suppress interferon in blood and muscle, you can actually help improve muscle strength. This has just been a phase one trial, but um, I think They'll be looking at it in the future again. And then this is one of my last slides, just talking about some of the other agents. Fingolimod, some of you in the last year may have been, participated in this trial. It was run by Novartis. 
both for dermatomyositis and polymyositis, it was thought that it may affect T lymphocytes. Eclusimab is an agent and an infusion that is being looked at to help affect the complement levels that are thought to be affected in myositis. Um, another monoclonal antibody being looked at for T and B lymphocytes. And then this last agent, IMO 8400, is a um, oligonucleotide-based antagonist that basically is thought to help inhibit the immune response, and it's a drug by Idera. Um, some of you may have heard of that. It's actually a trial that's really recent in dermatomyositis, and in particular thought to help potentially the rash and itching. Um, so if you do have dermatomyositis and haven't had a great response to some of your agents, um, this might be a potential drug, and it's currently enrolling in clinical trial right now. Um, what I want to leave you with is this website called clinicaltrials.gov. For those of you that don't know, um, you can always get the updated information on what recent drug trials are going on in myositis. The beauty of this trial is if you just type in myositis in the search engine, once you go to clinicaltrials.gov, it'll list the trials that are either ongoing, that have been completed, that are enrolling. And then if you click into it, it tells you what sites might be nearest to you. Sometimes it's just one site. Sometimes there's 20 sites around the country. So um, if medication, some of the conventional therapies that we talked about today haven't helped you, clinical trials are a reasonable option to start entertaining um, if you need to. And um, I like this algorithm. This is actually published by Dr. Otis in 2015, last year. Um, again, this will be a slide that you guys can um, sort of use as a reference. Um, it separates out mild disease on the left side, where they just say use steroids. And then if you have moderate to severe disease, it sort of gives you an algorithm of some treatment options that you could discuss with your doctor if um, some of the agents that you've been on haven't worked. And I just wanted to leave you with that as a reference. Um, so in summary, I would still say that steroids is probably a very reasonable first-line agent. Um, it's usually the initial treatment in myositis. And then methotrexate and azathioprine are more of the second-line agents that we use concomitant with steroids. Um, especially in someone with moderate to severe disease. It's at that point where if you've been on high-dose steroids and a second agent and you've had absolutely no response at all, and I'm talking about not even a 10, 20 percent response here, if you're in that category, it's time to either ask your doctor if we need to relook at this diagnosis or if it's another opinion. Um, because the diagnosis might not be correct, which is why you might not be responding. Um, but if you have had a response, but it's just been not been perfect, my goal whenever I meet a patient is to get them to 90 or uh, to 100 percent. And I typically don't stop um, until I've explored several options with the patient. And there are a number of those options that we talked about today that you should talk to your doctor about. And the last point I want to make is that I think every patient, really optimal care is best. These medications are great, um, but you really need a good primary care doctor on board. You need a physical therapist. Um, you sometimes need your swallowing assessed very closely for dysphagia. Um, and a pulmonologist on board if you have interstitial lung disease. It's really a team effort if you want to have optimal care for myositis. And this is a view of, from my office in California. I'm just kidding, <laughs> but it's about 10 miles away if you come and visit us in California <laughs> at our center. Um, yes, I'm happy to take more questions. I'm sorry, say that again? Oh, um, so the, uh, the question's a very good um, one. 
what actually brings on a flare. You're doing great on some medications, and then a flare or worsening of weakness, swallowing, rash, something happened to tip you over. Um, probably the most common cause is that you've tapered a prednisone or a medication too fast. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of a delay between the time that you tapered and the time a flare happens. So even I would say if it's within a two to four week period prior to you having a flare that you lowered a prednisone dose or some agent, that's a possibility. Um, we all know neurologic, rheumatologic conditions um, can do worse in the setting of, severe, of stress, infection. We don't know exactly why, um, but we do know that if you're sick or if, you're, if you have an infection, that can sometimes trigger a flare from happening. But I, we don't really have a good explanation why. But I would always ask my patient first, were any of your medications changed? Or are you having a reaction to a medication? That's the alternative to ask. Is there a qu oh. I'm sorry, say that. Stress, um, too, some, you know, exercise is great. Too much exercise, going out and starting to heavy weight lift um, might not be the right answer. Listening to your body is very important in myositis. Listening to your muscles. Um, I think there was a question there. Yes. Um, thank you so much for your passion um, in the myositis area. I really appreciate it. And we love the photo. We are also uh, Northern California residents, um, but that is not my office <laughs> outlook. It's just over the hill and we're at the beach. That's not my office either. I wish it were my office. <laughs> but my, my question is this. Um, you know, we have the various lines of, of defense there. And I have IDL. And currently, um, I'm looking for a moisturizer for the lips. Because when you use oxygen, you can't have petroleum in the product. So is there something that you can recommend? I'm hearing glycerin. Um, but I'm really concerned now with just trying the moisturize and using my cannula, you know, with that in mind and the ingredients and that moisturizer. And um, have you ever tried, for the rash, have you ever tried topical steroids even? Um, no, for the, to moisturize the lips. I see. Just for the lips. Right. Um, I don't necessarily have a personal recommendation just for the lips, aside from I think glycerin can be quite helpful. Um, but um, for the overall rash, sometimes trying the topical steroids can help. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I thought you all... Oh, please. Yes, please. So um, most neurologists have a standard, especially those that, of us that take care of myositis patients, have a standard about five muscles that we check in the arms and five muscles we check in the legs. And um, there's a standard neurologic system where we grade muscle strength from a zero to five scale. That, uh, amongst neurologists, is um, language of how strong or um, weak a muscle is. And we actually score the muscle on a zero to five scale that is standardized. Um, most of the muscles that we check for myositis patients are your deltoids, biceps, triceps, and it's sort of on confrontational testing. So actually just pushing, pressure. We call it manual muscle testing. That's probably the most standard way of measuring muscle strength in a clinic. Um, I would say that if we don't detect weakness on that and someone is telling me I'm feeling fatigued, I'm feeling weak, I know you're not. When you push and pull at all my muscles, I know you're not really detecting weakness. That sometimes when 
we start using the aid of either an EMG, um, a muscle MRI to see if there is some subclinical involvement of muscle weakness that we just couldn't pick up by pushing on their muscles. Can I measure muscle strength without pushing on the muscles? Um, I, besides the patient telling me, um, I would always measure muscle strength. Well, this would be, say, say it was somebody who had a developmental disability, you couldn't follow commands if you were nonverbal. I see. I see. So that's when um, muscle imaging actually becomes quite helpful because. Um, Getting a muscle MRI can tell you if their edema and inflammation has responded to steroids treatment or not. Um, and so that's probably the best way to um, deal with a patient that isn't able to follow commands. You're welcome. That was a great question. I have one, one question. One question right Sorry, here. Where am I? Okay. Here we are. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I am recently diagnosed in February, started having some symptoms in November. Uh, had to really, couldn't raise my hands above my head. Um, and then I started aqua aerobics, and that seemed to have helped me a bit. And I was just wondering, should I do the outside of the water and inside of the water kind of as a combination? I didn't find I had as much success when I was just doing the, the uh, physical therapy part. I see. So do, do you recommend doing both? Um, I'm not a physiotherapist. However, I always tell my patients, I think aqua therapy is actually a great form of exercise in muscle disease. Um, it takes away gravity, so your muscles don't have to work against the gravity component, and you can sort of freely exercise the muscles. The challenge that myositis patients have is that this isn't a static disease. As you all know, there's ups and downs, um, sometimes on a monthly basis, sometimes even on a daily basis. And so um, I always tell my patients that I can't give you a magic number to exercise, but um, exercise we know is good. We also know too much exercise in the setting of severe disease can actually cause muscle problems. Um, too little exercise is not good either. And then listening to your muscles is very important. So if you have signs of severe muscle pain after, let's say, a half an hour of exercise, um, it may be too much for your body. If the next day you wake up and you can't even get out of bed because you exercised this time for an hour, yesterday, you know, previously you were exercising for a half an hour to 45 minutes and you did great. So you thought, today I'm going to push it and do an hour and a half. And then the next day you can't get out of bed. That's too much. So, um, so I, I know I don't have a straightforward answer for you, but. I think listening to the muscle pain component and fatigue is important. Um, and I think aqua therapy in general is very good for muscle disease. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.